네, 올해 부산국제영화제는 21회를 맞아 한국영화 장르의 해결사 이두용 감독님의 작품들을 한국영화 회고전을 통해 재조명합니다. 오늘 그 의미를 더욱 뜻깊게 기르고자 이 자리를 마련하였습니다. 이 자리를 찾아주신 내외의 귀빈 여러분 감사드립니다. 저는 이 행사의 진행을 맡은 부산국제영화제 한국영화 프로그래머 남동철입니다. Distinguished guests from home and abroad, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Korean Cinema Retrospective Night. The 21st Busan International Film Festival is shedding a new light on the works of director Lee Do Yong through our Korean Cinema Retrospective program. Thank you all for joining us to celebrate director Lee tonight. Sometimes it seems that every Korean director gets to make a film with Ahn San Ki. And Eunuch is the film that Korea's most esteemed actor made with director Lee Do Yong. In this 1986 film, Ahn plays a eunuch who's won the heart of a servant girl. Now that may sound a little innocent, but add to that the fact that the king, despite having a uh, full assortment of concubines to choose from, has focused on the same servant as the girl most likely to supply him with an heir. Compared to the Choson era epics we see nowadays, Eunuch looks a little cheap, but given that the film's exteriors were shot at real temples and palaces at several different locations, it's probably more authentic than the glossy CGI temples and palaces that we see nowadays. Uh, the film has sexual imagery that uh, will shock some people. Uh, however, it wasn't sexual imagery that got the film into trouble with censorship at the time of its release. Rather, the Korean government saw the film Eunuch as a metaphor for popular rebellion. And so they were worried that it was going to give the populace some ideas. Inexplicably, they changed their mind, possibly because Shin Song Ok had already filmed this story once before. So yes, the film's a remake. Uh, and the government didn't come to an end at that time. So maybe they thought better of it and thought it would be safe to, to do it. Now, normally I wouldn't reveal something about a film's ending. But when it comes to the ending of Eunuch and Ahn San Ki, there's a very good story to tell. Uh, in the finale, uh, Ahn San Ki is shot by arrows. And when I was watching the film, I saw one of the arrows go into the side of the wall. And I thought, wow, that looks really authentic. And the reason for that is because the arrows are real. In fact, for this final scene, Ahn San Ki was instructed to wear a wooden uh, breastplate that was going to prevent the arrows from uh, piercing his body. Now, understandably, he had some concerns about, you know, parts of his body that were not protected, like his head, for example. And so he was terrified while he was shooting this scene. And so he was really afraid of death as these arrows uh, came and hit his body, you know. So um, it, that's the reason it's very authentic. No stuntman in those days. And there's scenes earlier in the film where Aung San Ki is dunked into a well and, you know, it really is him. The thing is that the post-screening uh, Q&A for Eunuch, uh, director E did have the good grace to apologise to the actor for having put him through that experience. One of the things that was startling about The Oldest Son was that even though it was not an action film, there was no shortage of things going on. It's like a Korean TV drama condensed into just over two hours. It's a story of a family consisting of three sons and most prominently one who was newly successful in Korea's burgeoning computer industry in 1984 and another a violent drunk. The third son is a handsome young man who doesn't really contribute much other than he does look after the grandparents at one stage. One of Korea's most prolific actors, Shin Song Il, plays a successful son, and it's his ambition to look after his parents. But in the touch of Tokyo's story, the family is a bit too chaotic to make a good job of it. In a post-screening talk, director Lee talked about how the story was partially inspired by his own experience of wanting to buy an apartment for his own parents. And when he was showing his parents the apartment, they were looking at a top floor apartment, and his mother asked, well, when I die, how will they get the coffin downstairs? Because the coffins wouldn't fit in a elevator. And there's a taboo about tilting coffins or making them vertical, making the dead body vertical. So he, you know, the director then realized he had a germ of a story. 
about you know Korea on the cusp of social change, and if you read between the lines, political change as well. The film will be a bit soapy for some, but it was also genuinely humorous, and at times very, very touching. And it has that Korean element of realism that I really enjoy, which is that the film shows Korean people as they are, or in this case, as they were, not as they hoped to be remembered. This film proved a bit of a challenge as there were no English subtitles, but my high school French got a solid workout. As far as I could understand, it's the story of a man who goes to his home island where his mother has just died and his niece is still living. Shunned by the local villagers for reasons that weren't entirely clear to me, the uncle who arrives with his comic relief buddy who keeps falling over all the time, these, these two men discover that there's a shaman on the island who's basically leading his own little cult and as the outsiders become more knowledgeable, they become a threat, and the island's body count gets higher and higher. The print, besides only having French subtitles, was in an extremely faded condition, purple and black essentially. But this low-budget thriller still had a lot to recommend it, even under these circumstances. In a post-screening interview, director E talked about how property developers and other manifestations of Korea's progress in the 1970s were coming to these islands around Korea and would encounter many forms of resistance from the locals, including from shamans who could see that the, their authority would be usurped. But again, like the melodrama The Oldest Son, part of the film's appeal is the way it depicts the tensions between the old culture of Korea, in this case shamanism, against the encroaching westernisation, which would be the future of Korea. But here director E does it in the context of the sh thriller genre. The film has several cuts due to censorship at the time, particularly in erotic and rape scenes. But director E says that as he never used or would use complete nudity, he didn't mind the censorship so much. He never tried to avoid being censored, and as long as the intention was clear, he just accepted it. The Hut was one of the highlights, a beautifully restored film, and one direct ease best. It's another shaman story with a great twist, which of course I'm not going to reveal here. A rich provincial family find that their son is comatose with a mysterious disorder that cannot be cured. In desperation, they call in every shaman in Chosen to cure him, and the only one that doesn't freak out when a snake disrupts a ritual is a young and unknown shaman, Aqua, played by the gorgeous Uji In. With the family's support, Aqua quickly traces the source of the evil spirit that's taken possession of the young man. And so begins an extended flashback that is the story behind the story. This was apparently the first Korean film to be selected for the Venice Film Festival. It won a prize there, which then caused the hut to be very popular in Korea after being initially overlooked. The restored film played at Cannes earlier this year and really deserves to travel widely. Utterly Korean, it's an example of 80s Korean filmmaking that's both beautifully and emotionally charged in a way that the early years, E's 1977 Shaman film, is not. It has a foreboding, if slightly repetitious, soundtrack, and of the films that I saw in this retrospective, it also has the best mise-en-scene. The visuals are beautifully composed. I can't speak too highly about this film. This film was originally based on a series of short stories when it was proposed to director E that he make an omnibus film. Deepening my respect for director E is that he doesn't like omnibus films, so what he did was take three of the stories and weave them together, quite a deliberate pun on his part I think, he weaved these stories together so that they all happened to the same woman. Due to this, spinning the tales of cruelty toward women has a touch of Mizuguchi's The Life of Oharu about it. But at the same time, director E maintains a strong realism in this chosen era story. The lead character, Gil Ray, magnificently played by Won Mi Kyung, is molested by her father-in-law after becoming a young widow at the beginning of the film, and is then rescued by an honourable young man who will then become her lover. As they run away together, Gil Ray finds that the twists of fate are cruel and inescapable in a male-dominated society. Like a lot of feminist melodrama, the elusiveness of the happy ending is the point, because anything else is a denial of reality. On a technical note, while director E is a filmmaker who's fond of close-ups, in this film he really goes to town. And in a film where an actress has to exercise a lot of Confucian restraint, those close-ups are particularly powerful. This emotional eloquence is also underlined here by the use of pansery style music composed specifically for the film, which poses the question about whether this level of suffering 
is really what Confucius had in mind when he constructed his philosophy. In many ways, Manchurian Tiger is the Edo Yong film that a lot of Pusan visitors were most excited about. But before you start thinking about masterpieces, I think it's more likely to come under the category of guilty pleasure. And even director E himself in a post-film Q&A talked about Manchurian Tiger as an unnutritious film. The film was made as a response to the Bruce Lee kung fu craze, the importation of Hong Kong films into Korean, Korea generally, and as the first kimchi western as a response to the work of Sergio Leone. The central character, truly a man with no name, but generally referred to as Mr. Taekwondo, is played by Korean-American martial artist Han Yong Chol. This baby-faced actor, which necessitated the addition of a moustache, played the Taekwondo fighter with humorous nonchalance that compensates for the film's plethora of other failings. It is what it is, and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. The direction is not as polished as the other films in the E! retrospective, but the hero's grace and his fighting moments are well captured, and if not as flashy as Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan, the actor proves capable of delivering the required level of physical performance.